event of the fall semester in the Free Speech Battles Program, which is a year-long series of lectures and workshops on contemporary controversies about speech and expression. The series is organized by the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy here at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Matt Schaefer, a postdoctoral fellow at the center, moderating tonight's event. Um, I'd like to thank the Free Speech Battles Planning Committee, which is chaired by Sigal Ben Porath of the School of Education. Um, her own incisive work on such debates has been really fundamental for illuminating the concerns of our, our entire program this year. Um, also on the committee is Joseph Lowry of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, Sophia Rosenfeld of History, Amy Seppenwall of the Wharton School, Takufu Zuberi of Sociology, Jeff Green, uh, the director of the Mitchell Center and a professor of political science, and Matthew Roth, the center's assistant director. Our event tonight is co-sponsored by the SNF Paideia program here at, here at Penn. Um, we're really grateful for their support. And I'd also like to thank uh, Chloe Bacalar for assistance in organizing tonight's event. Um, over the past few months and past events in this series, we've taken up issues ranging from the future of legacy news media to the resurgence of white nationalism in the United States. And tonight, we're going to turn to problems that lie right at the center of the terrain on which so many of those other developments have unfolded, the politics of social media. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Jamie Settle of the College of William and Mary, who will be taking on such questions for us. Professor Settle is the David and Carolyn Wakefield Term Associate Professor of Government at William and Mary, where she's also the director of the Social Networks and Political Psychology Lab and the co-director of the Social Science Research Methods Center. Professor Settle is a scholar of American political behavior with expertise in the fields of political psychology and communication. Her research focuses on how political interactions, both face-to-face -face and online, affect how individuals perceive conflict in their environment, how they evaluate other people, how they engage with the political system as a whole. In her work, she, she integrates tools from other disciplines, such as behavior genetics, psychophysiology, and data science, in order to, to, to inform um, our approach to understanding key questions in the study of politics. She's the author of many peer-reviewed articles and has received numerous awards for her research. Her 2018 book, entitled Frenemies, How Facebook Polarizes America, won the Best Book Award from the Experiments in Politics section of the American Political Science Association. Professor Settle will open the session with a presentation, after which the floor will be open to take questions submitted into the queue. Our main event concludes at 6.30. But afterwards, the SNF Paideia program, in association with the undergraduate organization Table Talk, will host a roundtable that will, that, will, that will provide students with an opportunity for more informal and open-ended conversation with Professor Settle and with each other. We'll post information on how to join that event in the chat window. And with that, I'd like to turn over the floor, the floor to Professor Settle. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, and thank you to everyone at the center who worked uh, to make this series possible and to invite me to join you all tonight. Uh, I've been so impressed uh, watching everything that's uh, unrolled over the fall and hearing all these great speakers you've had, and I'm honored to be able to contribute as part of that. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Uh, if someone could give me a thumbs up that it looks like things are all right, um, so the, the talk tonight I wanna focus on is uh, the book that I published a couple of years ago called Frenemies, How Social Media Polarizes America. And I wrote this book in a context of much larger societal conversations about the role of social media and politics. Uh, if you think back to the 2016 election, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk that Facebook and other social media companies had uh, essentially ignored the problems of misinformation and disinformation on their sites. Uh, and in the aftermath of the election, we saw what a big problem the circulation of fake news was. Uh, that election also came on the heels of the Cambridge Analytica scandal and concerns about how people's uh, data and information on social media might be being used. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg has been in front of Congress multiple times and over the past few years uh, really has, has changed his tune about the concerns over the kind of information that is circulating on Facebook. And I think that Facebook made a real effort within this election cycle uh, to, to more responsibly uh, try to get a sense for what was circulating and make some decisions to make sure that higher quality information was circulating about the election. 
But all of this focus on bad actors and the way that the site can be manipulated by people whose intentions are not good uh, loses a bit of sense about the way that we're communicating with each other and the problems that might be a part of the way that we communicate about politics in such a polarized moment in our country's history. And I put this quote up here, it's, it's in the beginning of the book, as kind of a reminder that this is not the first time in our country where we have had deep disagreements that seem to be tearing us apart. Uh, and I think it's important to focus in these broader debates about social media, about the contribution that we all are making as part of our day-to-day -day use of a site uh, that may be exacerbating a lot of the tensions that we're seeing. And at the end of the talk, and hopefully in the, the question and answer at the end, we can dive more into how we might think about changes to the status quo. What are some of the ways we could incentivize communication uh, that, that activates these better angels of our nature and helps us communicate and deliberate in a more responsible way? In the talk tonight, I'm going to present the motivating puzzle within the book and then the central argument that I make and then a lot of evidence to support those claims. But I'm really hoping that this will generate questions. Um, I'm most interested in hearing what you all have to say and, and jumpstarting the conversation there. I want to start by being clear on the, the motivating concept here of psychological polarization. Uh, so any political scientists in the audience will know that, that as a discipline, we've been studying polarization for about 20, 25 years. And our early focus was on issue polarization or attitudinal polarization. And it was this idea that uh, people might be becoming more extreme in the opinions that they had about issues. And the evidence for that is fairly mixed, but what we did discover as a discipline over time and develop a lot of consensus about is that there are growing forms of psychological polarization. And this refers both to perceived polarization or people's beliefs that there are large differences between Democrats and Republicans in this country as well as the concept of effective polarization. And these are um, negative evaluations and negative feelings that we hold towards our political out party. And so the, the situation we're in at this moment is that we know our political elites are polarized. We know that the rhetoric they're using uh, is, is very polarizing. Um, at the same time, we know that most people's political opinions are, are fairly jumbled or moderate, uh, that there's actually fair amounts of consensus in the actual political preferences that many Americans have. But layered on top of this, our social identities have sorted. And so in addition to uh, this, this split between Democrats and Republicans, where conservatives have found more of a home in the Republican Party and liberals have found more of a home in the Democratic Party, we also know that that divide layers on top of other important social identities, such as um, religious identities or racial identities or even geographic identities. And what we've seen over time is that there's increasingly negative feelings towards the political out party. Um, while people have generally warm feelings, as are shown here in the solid line um, over time for their own political party, we've seen this drop off in the affect or the emotions that they have towards their political opponents. And this has seemed to move beyond just feelings about disagreeing with the other side's policy preferences. Uh, this is a, a graph that I like to show coming from a publication uh, now published almost a decade ago that was looking at a survey question uh, asking if the respondents would be upset if their child uh, married someone from another party. And you can see that in 1960, this was just not a salient divide for people. They were you know, not concerned about their child marrying someone from the opposing party. But by 2008 and then 2010, you see that about half of Republicans and about a third of Democrats were concerned about that. And this question is getting at something about people's values or their morals, their worldviews. This has more to do with just disagreement over the issues of the day. And while it might be clear to understand why Americans have developed negative feelings towards elites of the opposing party, there's lots of opportunities to hear these elites communicate on the news or on social media. Uh, it's much more confusing to try to understand why is it that we've transferred this negative affect towards our fellow citizens. 
mean, the question here is you can, you know, understand why someone might um, dislike, you know, Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, but how is it that they've come to dislike their neighbor who posts a yard sign for Clinton or Biden, uh, you know, have so much dislike for their, their, uh, their neighbors, their fellow citizens? And this is really the question that motivated me and where I think social media can make a real contribution. Social media is clearly not the root of the problem of polarization in our country, but I think that it's really critical for this, this transfer of negative feelings, how we move from disliking the out party to disliking people who are part of that out party. And the argument that I make in the book is that the, the characteristics of how people communicate about politics on the Facebook news feed are uniquely suited to facilitate these psychological processes. And so what's going on when people post to the news feed and respond to each other is that it makes it clearer to recognize other people's identities and to receive positive reinforcement for the expression of your own identity. And that several features of the newsfeed are structured to facilitate this biased information processing, where we tend to think that our beliefs are in more of a majority than they are, um, where we don't have a good sense for the size and the amount of support for our group, um, where it's very easy to make overgeneralized statements about our political outgroup. And this is part of something that's called social identity theory. This is a, a theory that long predates social media, and there's been a lot of evidence for over the past few decades, but that um, I think social media is kind of the perfect real life incubator for. And um, we know from these decades of work that once people recognize an in-group and an out-group, uh, they start to make more distinctions between them and they start to be more judgmental, uh, more positive feelings towards their in-group and more negative feelings towards the out-group. So I'm going to walk through uh, five principal arguments that I make in the book uh, and then um, wrap up a bit at the end with some of the implications here. So the first point that I want to make is that when we think about what political engagement on Facebook is, we need to think about it differently uh, than we have in the past as purely a, a political behavior. Uh, so in case anyone is not familiar, this is a uh, basic outline of what Facebook looks like. So it obviously evolves over time. Um, I'm talking about the news feed. I'm talking about this central uh, landing page where information arrives from the people to whom you're connected on the site. And previous scholarship that had looked at the effects of content on the Facebook news feed had focused largely on the political content that circulates. And so trying to understand if, if reading that content or reading the headlines had an effect on people's attitudes. But most people are not getting on Facebook for political purposes. Yes, a lot of people report that they do get news on Facebook, but that's not the primary reason why they are using the site. The reason they're using the site is to connect with their family and friends and get a sense for what's going on in other people's lives. And as a consequence of that, we should think about how they process the information they encounter in a similar way. They're not necessarily trying to learn about the news, they're trying to learn about the way that their friends engage with the news. And so even without clicking on any political content on Facebook, there's a lot of information that's available. Uh, this slide kind of walks through a schematic of the different sorts of information that's available even before you've clicked on an article. An example here is a, a story that my college roommate posted, and I know her views well. I'm not going to learn anything about her views by seeing what she posts on Facebook. But in all of the information below the post, I do stand to learn a lot about how our mutual friends and her other friends engage with this post. And so I'm learning the viewpoints that I wouldn't otherwise have known um, because people are engaging with each other uh, in, in the comment section by you know, showing uh, support for my friend posting this. And so it's these other features of Facebook that really help with this social inference and social processing that I think are a major consequence of how people use the site. Another really unique thing about the way people communicate on social media is what I think of as the fly on the wall effect. Um, so what we know about political communication is that most people tend to talk about politics uh, with the people that they're closest to and that they're more likely to share political views with the people that they are close to. 
Um, what's interesting on Facebook is you're encouraged to make connections with your weaker social ties. And then you have the ability to observe those weaker social ties communicating with their strong ties about politics. And this is a, a, a something that can be observed that is not possible in a face to face context, seeing a bunch of people that you disagree with, but who all agree with each other, seeing them talk about politics is not something possible offline your very presence would change the way that they were communicating. But this ability to be a fly on the wall and see how other people are communicating uh, really gives us a window into learning other people's political opinions that we would not have had otherwise. All right, so the second claim here is that people are encountering this political content that's mixed in with a bunch of other content that they're seeing on the site, um, but that they're able to make inferences of the political views based on what they see on the site. And this was motivated by a paradox that had emerged from previous survey work. Um, with this, this fact here, it said, this is coming from the Pew Research Center, who found that 78% of Facebook users say that none or only a little bit of what they post to Facebook is related to politics. But two other facts complicate that a bit. So, you know, the vast majority, 69% of Facebook users report that they've learned other people's views on the sites. And maybe that's because, you know, everyone has those squeaky wheels in their net worth, people who talk about politics a lot. So maybe we're all just learning the viewpoints of the small handful of people who talk about politics a lot. But this third statistic up here seems to, to belie that. So the fact that 81% of Facebook users can provide an answer about the overall distribution of opinions in their network suggests that we're learning much more widely than just the people who say that they're talking about politics. And trying to reconcile this paradox led me to think about how it is that we might be able to learn people's views about politics, even if they themselves didn't think that they were talking about politics. And so I did a series of studies that I call the inference studies, um, where I posted a, a series of example text uh, from Facebook uh, to a set of research subjects using an online portal. And I asked them to give me their impressions of the person who posted uh, that sort of information. So I have an example for you here. Um, the instructions that I would give our uh, survey respondents, I said, sometimes our first impressions of people are quite accurate. We're interested in your first impression of the person who posted the following content on Facebook. And then the status update reads, I still get unbelievably happy when I think about the day that gay marriage became legal in all 50 states. I cried so many happy tears. So if it's possible, if we could try throwing up the Zoom poll, uh, I'm curious what our audience here thinks. So do you think that this, the person who posted the status update on Facebook do you think that they were more likely to be a Democrat, more likely to be a Republican, or do you really genuinely have no idea the political views of the person who posted that? Uh, so let's take maybe 15 seconds here, let you think about it. Again, the status update reads, I still get unbelievably happy when I think about the day gay marriage became legal in all 50 states. I cried so many happy tears. All right, let's go ahead and close that and see what you all thought. All right, so we achieved broad consensus here. 91% of you thought that the person who posted this was likely to be a Democrat. Now, this is an example of someone in a, an emotionally expressive way, but is talking about a policy issue. And so maybe it's, it's not a big surprise that we were able to achieve consensus on this, given what we know about public opinion polling about gay marriage. But let's try this next example. Um, oops. All right, so this next example here, uh, the same direction. Sometimes our first impressions of people are quite accurate. Um, this one is showing an image of a, a country music star standing in front of a, uh, an American flag. And the headline here says, country music star wonders what happened to America's work ethic. So let's do the poll again. Same options here. How many people think that this was likely to have been posted by a Democrat, likely to have been posted by a Republican, 
or honestly have no idea about the political views of the person who posted this. So I'll give you another few seconds to think through this. All right, let's see what the results are. All right, again here, broad consensus that 73% of people thought that the person who posted this was likely to be a Republican. Now, I've asked this to audiences all across the United States, audiences of all ages. I've also um, asked this of people all over the world when I give this presentation, and people are able to achieve consensus on posts like this. And it's it is a mystery to me how we are all arriving at these same points of consensus where we map certain cultural symbols and associations to people's political views. Um, but we are able to achieve broad consensus. And what my study showed is that on dozens and dozens and dozens of examples like this, my survey subjects were also able to achieve consensus about this. So what I would do is I would show uh, our survey subjects a series of these stimuli after each one that they saw. I asked them to tell me whether or not the content was political. Um, ask them to tell me about the knowledge level, political knowledge level of the person who posted it, and then ask them to tell me about the partisanship and ideology of the person who posted it, like I just had you all do. And the punchline from this series of studies that I did is that a really broad range of content is considered to be political. Political scientists have typically focused on a more narrow definition, thinking about elected officials, uh, thinking about policy debates, or thinking about the bureaucracy. But people actually consider a much wider range of things to be political. Uh, and so it's very possible that what one person posts thinking that they're not being political, someone else interprets as being political. People are also able to attribute a partisan identity to someone based on even the non-political content that they post. And so this is the second example that I had you all do, where a lot of this content that people themselves said, no, that's not necessarily about politics, but it was still informative about the signal uh, of someone's political views. A lot of a, uh, consensus was achieved in these evaluations. And when I did a follow-up study to try to understand whether or not people were accurate in these inferences, there's general, general accuracy, but where the bias came in is that it was very hard for people who considered themselves independents or political moderates to post content that people recognized as such. So people were more likely to attribute partisanship or ideological extremity to someone even when it wasn't there. And so the punchline here is that when we're thinking about political communication on social media, we need to broaden our scope and we need to think about politically informative content and all the ways that we might be signaling our identity, even when we don't necessarily think that we are. In another follow-up study I did, I wanted to know whether or not adding a media source cue could be additionally informative to people. So whether or not the, the story itself was about politics, uh, if we think that people understand uh, that some sources are of a leaning to the right or to the left, would people attribute that leaning to the person who posted that content? And what I found there is that, yes, it is in fact the case that um, content that's posted from Fox News, people are more inclined to think that content was posted by someone who's a Republican. Uh, and so this is the results of a study. It's looking at the same pool of content, but I randomly assigned the source attribution. And that same pool of content, about half of the evaluations thought that the, the poster was Republican when it had a Fox News header uh, and, and considerably lower proportions when there was no header or when the, the uh, post was attributed to the Huffington Post. And so what this means is that Americans have become savvy enough to recognize that our news source um, may be a signal of our political views. And so even if you truly aren't posting about politics, but you prefer to read Fox News, that's going to send a signal to other people about what your political views are likely to be. So the punchline of this whole first part of the talk is that the the way that Facebook is structured and the norms we've developed about the, the affordances, the features on that site, make it very easy to inadvertently signal your identity and attitudes and for other people to make inferences about your political views, even if you don't think that you're talking about politics. 
this communication then goes into an ecosystem where it's very easy to to have cognitive biases to which we're all prone be exacerbated and these cognitive biases then perpetuate what's called false polarization or this idea that we're um, farther apart in our beliefs than we are in reality um, and so i'm going to talk about one of these cognitive biases i dive into more in the book um, but the one that i'm going to focus on is something called the outgroup homogeneity effect and I put this, uh, these silly figures up on the slide, but the central point here is that it's a lot easier to, to recognize diversity within our in-group than it is to recognize diversity in our out-group. And one thing we know is that the people who are likely to explicitly talk about politics on Facebook are those who have the strongest viewpoints and are more likely to be extreme in their viewpoints. Uh, now, most people aren't talking about politics, but those who are, are more likely to have these extreme views. Now, within our in-group, because of our own views, because most of our friends and our family are going to share our viewpoints, we can position someone's post and understand, well, that person, you know, is maybe more extreme in their viewpoints, but I know that my in-party, my group has a lot more diversity of opinion than that. But we're not able to do the same thing when we think about our political outgroup. We're not able to recognize that the person who posts political content that we disagree with is not a prototype, is not representative of all of the viewpoints that the outgroup holds. And so we tend to think that the, the outgroup is composed much more of extremists than our own group and that the two groups are in essence further apart from one another. The fourth mechanism that I think is going on here is that the feedback that people get when they do post political content reinforces their identity. And so I, I did an experiment here to try to understand whether or not those people who do post about politics are more likely to have a stronger attachment to their party when they get more positive feedback. The way I did the study was on a student subject pool at the William, uh, College of William and Mary where I work. And I, uh, in the pre-study before people came into the lab, I had them read an article and then I asked them to write what they would write if they were going to share that article to Facebook. Uh, I had them do this, then I had them do one of the inference tasks I described earlier, but I told them that the content they were evaluating had been posted by other members of the student subject pool. And this was to create realism for the idea that they were evaluating the content posted by their peers. Um, after they took this um, pre-survey, I had my research assistants format what they had written uh, to look uh, like this, so to make it look like they had actually made a post to Facebook. And then the experimental manipulation was here at the bottom. It was very subtle. It was just manipulating how many other people uh, had liked what they had written. And then I had them come into the research lab. I handed them an envelope uh, that they either were in this high feedback group or a low feedback group. And then I asked them some follow up questions. Now, this experiment was admittedly clunky and I wasn't sure that it was going to work. But I think the fact that it works goes to show that the effects are likely even stronger in the more organic experience like the actual news feed. What I found is that the subjects who were in that high social feedback condition um, had a, a higher estimate of the percentage of their peers who agreed with their post. They scored more highly on a social psychological measure of partisan attachment. They were more likely to say that they would actually share their post on Facebook, and they were more willing to let me as a researcher use their post in presentations like this. And so all of these are signs that they were willing to be expressive partisans and felt like they had a lot of support for their viewpoints. And I think this is an important aspect of what goes on on Facebook. The people who do talk about politics typically get a lot of positive feedback for doing so in the forms of likes or comments from their like-minded peers. And they tend to overestimate the proportion of support uh, among the population uh, for people who share their own viewpoints. The final point here is the, the logical outcome of social identity theory is that once we have recognized differentiation, recognized an in-group and an out-group, and we feel more attached to our in-group, we start to make differentiations between the groups that don't have anything to do with what divided the groups in the first place, 
And also we tend to exacerbate our stereotypes about members of the out group. And this is kind of classic social identity theory. These are findings that have been replicated in dozens of different ways over the last 50 years. Um, and what I found is I, I put together a, a stereotype battery uh, about statements uh, about uh, the extent to which people uh, behave in stereotyped ways. And what I found is that uh, even people who are weak partisans themselves are judgmental about the political knowledge of outgroup members based on the non-political content that they post. Um, what Facebook does, what using Facebook regularly seems to do, is give people more confidence in their accuracy to make these sorts of inferences. And so it's not that Facebook teaches us to make associations necessarily, but it's giving us practice in doing so and seems to increase our confidence, our ability to make inferences about other people. We make these same judgments about our actual contacts on Facebook, not just uh, in the studies uh, that I presented to people with anonymous posters to Facebook. And when I ask people to evaluate their contacts on Facebook, social closeness does not seem to reduce this uh, judgment. So typically we think that the closer you are, the less likely you are to be stereotyped about someone. Uh, but I found in these studies that people were willing to be stereotyped uh, and judgmental about the knowledge levels and, and the quality of information that people use, even among their, their very close ties, if they perceived that their close ties disagreed with them. So this is the stereotype battery that I asked on uh, one of the, the surveys fielded to a survey that looks like a nationally representative sample, asking people about uh, their estimates of the percent of all the voters in their out party who uh, fit with these different stereotypes. And what I found is that people who told me that they post more political content uh, it did in fact estimate a higher proportion of out party voters who adhere to those stereotypes. But that's not that surprising because we know that the people who are likely to be the most political online are going to be the strongest partisans and are likely more polarized anyway. I found though that people who are exposed to more political content on social media also estimate a higher proportion of out voters adhere to their stereotypes. But it's possible that the reason they're exposed to more political content has to do with their own interest in politics. And, and that could be the same story as well, that they're more likely to follow politics, maybe more likely to be polarized for that. I think the finding that's most conclusive is that um, Facebook users compared to non-Facebook users and people who use the site more frequently compared to those who use it rarely also estimate a higher proportion of out party voters adhere to the stereotype. And this is getting at the crux of my argument, which is that for people who are not all that inclined to care about politics, are not all that interested, are not all that vested, they're not able to escape this process on Facebook where they learn to make inferences about other people. And so just using the site, even if you don't think you're using it in a particularly political way, may be contributing to your stereotyped associations of people in the political out party. So the, the first part of the talk is about how the way that Facebook is structured and the norms we've used, uh, developed when we use it, make it easy to inadvertently signal your viewpoints. The second part is that the ability to express this identity means that social media platforms are like a real live laboratory for the processes of social identity theory, that it reinforces our in-group identity, it exacerbates differences between the in-group and the out-group, and it makes us more judgmental about the political out-group. Now thinking about my research within the context of this series, you know, the concern here, and, and this was the quote that I put at the very beginning about, you know, the better angels of our nature, the concern here is that this is contributing to the, the crumbling of the mutual tolerance that is required within a democracy for people to have high enough quality exchanges about politics. And I think what's especially worrying here is that what I study is people using Facebook as it was intended. They're using Facebook to share information about themselves and circulate information that they find important or interesting or funny, but that very intended use is leading to these pernicious consequences. 
And I think what this has caused is a, an ecosystem online that is really ripe for all of those bad actors, so to speak. I mean, we as a society have created an environment on Facebook where people, it was very easy for people who wanted to spread disinformation to be able to do so. Uh, you know, we think about this in terms of the ability for things to spread virally. But I think what my results suggest is that there's a, a credibility gap that people really do trust information from their side, from their people, from their like-minded contacts, and really are disinclined to believe things coming from the other side and are very judgmental about the information that the other side is using. And the way that we communicate on Facebook has contributed to this demonization of the other side, which I think has laid the groundwork for increasingly high rates of Americans who are endorsing behavior that they think, you know, is countering what they perceive as the illegitimacy of our system or, or our election. So I mean here, you know, endorsing violence if your side does not win an election or endorsing the actions of those who are seeking to overturn the election. And so this is worrisome and, and I hope that uh, we can talk about this more in the Q&A in terms of what the implications are. Uh, at the end of my book, I talk a bit about a guiding framework for how we might get ourselves out of this position. In the immediate aftermath of the 2016 election, a lot of pundits called for people to abandon Facebook, calling it a, a lost cause, essentially. And, you know, we were talking in the minutes before the talk got started about the interesting timing of this event, given the news uh, of, about, uh, you know, this suit against Facebook, uh, trying to break it up, essentially. And I think that's a bit misguided in the sense that, that even if Facebook is broken apart, the you know, the era of social media is upon us. Changing or getting rid of Facebook is not going to change this desire we now have to be able to communicate digitally, socially with um, anyone and everyone easily. And so I think that there are actually some reasons to think that Facebook as a large powerful company might be better positioned to deal with some of the pernicious problems of actors with bad intents because of their resources and their ability to fight it. Other people have called for a suppression of political interaction. So, you know, the more extreme version of this is that Facebook should try to, to shut down political communication on the site. Uh, I think the more maybe realistic is that the norm should shift on the site so that we don't talk about politics as much. I also think this is misguided. Uh, one of the things that emerges from my book is that it's not just explicitly political content that has the, these deleterious outcomes. So I don't think that just talk, not talking about politics anymore is the solution. I mean, not only is that an illiberal solution, uh, but it, it's not something that would actually solve the problem that we're trying to solve. And so the framework that I suggest is that we shouldn't fight human nature. I mean, where a lot of the processes I describe are, are kind of deep-seated psychological tendencies and cognitive biases to which we're all inclined. You, you can't fight many of those things particularly effectively. And we need to respect the fact that the social media companies don't want to make changes that are, are going to undermine their bottom line financially. And so the trick is to find the kinds of changes on the site, the, the affordances or the features on the site, find the, the right tweaks to those that could incentivize more desirable behavior. And if you use those affordance changes to try to incentivize more desirable communication, you might be able to change some of the norms on the site. And those changing norms are what could lead us to have a, a more realistic understanding of other people's actual political opinions uh, and could help us uh, inoculate ourselves a little bit more against the, the rampant misinformation that tends to circulate on these sites. Now, this is much easier said than done. I'm not suggesting that I have at all have figured this all out, but I do think this is a helpful way to think about moving forward in terms of thinking about what features on the site seem particularly uh, to activate our psychological tendencies and then working in, in that intersection to try to make small changes that can make a big difference. I want to make sure uh, and give a special thanks to all of the uh, research assistants who helped me over a number of years on this project. 
Uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing all of your questions. Um, so Matt, I think I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much. I mean, this is a fantastic project and it's, it's great to see this, this picture of it. Um, one thing that I really like about, about your work is that, is that you push us beyond a kind of familiar narrative that I think a lot of people have about, um, about, about the politics of social media, right? We're used to talking about Facebook in terms of things like, like uh, echo chambers or um, filter bubbles, right? This idea that like the problem with Facebook is that it, it, it polarizes people because they end up only talking to, um, you know, people they already agree with. And I think, I think it's, it's really significant here that you're showing that like a lot of what's actually happening is that, is that people's views are, are shaped in these deep ways by the impressions that they form through the specific way that like, like Facebook shows them the people that they disagree with, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's a really interesting takeaway from this, from this research. But one thing that, that I'd be interested in hearing more about sort of from this perspective is, is what this means for how we should interpret the rise of sort of newer social media platforms like um, Parler, right? So, so for those who aren't familiar, you know, it, uh, um, over the past year or so, a lot of people, especially um, on the American right, out of, you know, in, in response to concerns about sort of more active um, Facebook moderation of or um, or uh, management of political content. Um, a lot of people have started sort of migrating to to other um, social media platforms that might actually be more sort of ideologically siloed in a certain sense. Do you think that 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 sort of account of of the process of why people are leaving Facebook for these other sites? Do you think that that's accurate? And if it is, like like what does to, to the insights of your work have to teach us about these sort of sort of new frontiers of, of online discussion? Yeah, that's a, a great question uh, and, and definitely one I've been mulling over. So I don't think it's uh, a wrong interpretation of what's happened so far, but I also don't think it's a very sustainable business model if you're trying to be a social media site that's going to displace Facebook. And the reason I say that is because one of the core arguments I make, and I think it's just a statement of reality, most people are not using social media for political purposes. They are using social media to stay connected to their family and friends, or in the case of you know, other sites like Twitter or YouTube that are more about information dissemination, they, they wanna be able to find the information they wanna access. But on a site like Facebook or you know, Parler, my understanding is it's, it's trying to replicate many of the aspects of the overall Facebook design. You want to be on the site where your family and friends are. And so if Parler's model is to appeal more to one side of the political spectrum than the other, you're going to draw people who want that and want to talk about politics and, and, and are drawn to, you know, sort of the, the ideological model underpinning it, but it's never going to become the site where you're going to be able to find out what's going on in the lives of your friends and, and family members across the political spectrum. Uh, and so I think that, you know, it's, I don't, foresee a situation in which a site like Parler would displace a site like Facebook, where you really do have a much broader swath of people who want to, to be on it. One danger I see, though, is that on a site like Parler, where there is considerably less moderation, you know, essentially no moderation, um, we know that when people are truly in an echo chamber, when they're not being um, you know, listened to by a more diverse audience that, that people in these like minded discussions do tend to become more extreme in their viewpoints. And so the concern I see is that content that circulates in a site like Parler might find its way then into a more mainstream site like Facebook. And I think, you know, Reddit would be a good example for this. And so it's, it's definitely concerning, uh, but I don't see it displacing Facebook because most people want to, to be where their family and friends are. That, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I want to remind the whole audience that that uh, you're welcome to to submit questions typed into the into the Q and A queue, um, and we'll start turning to some of those in a moment. But I, I want to follow up quickly um, with something else that I've been thinking about on this, uh, which you know I think I think a lot of people are interested to hear hear more about um, how you think uh, we can redress some of these issues. Um, you know, I, I in in reading the final chapter of your book, um, one one sort of sort of option that you put forward that I was really struck by is the idea that platforms like Facebook um, could uh, 
do various things to more actively incentivize um, the sort of sort of moderate forms of political expression. Um, uh, and, and, and in part that has to do with the way in which um, that can help like bridge conversations, right? Like, like have people put out views that, that provide sort of, sort of points of contact between otherwise widely separated um, positions. But one thing that seems like a complexity there for, for, for the sort of ambiguous way that in the wider public sphere, we talk about things like moderation and extremism and political viewpoints is I guess the question of whether that's really about about the content of people's views, like are they political centrists, right? Or the the form of expression that their views take, right? Like are they are they civil in in how they are are presenting their views? Um, and so some people in emphasizing moderate, you know, the importance of moderate expression are going to emphasize civility, and other people are going to emphasize like like ideological cross cuttingness. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think one is more important th than the other? Do you think there are there are distinctive risks in sort of sort of emphasizing one over the other in these kinds of conversations, or particular benefits to one or the other? And you can take this also, please, as a as a opportunity to talk more broadly about um, how you think some of these issues can be addressed. Sure, sure. So, you know, I I thought about this a lot, and I think one of the main, I, I guess, an additional complexity to what you specified is that the people who we expect to be the most moderate in terms of the extremity dimension on their viewpoints also tend to be the people who are the least interested in politics. And so any call for more moderate voices to step up and join the political conversation is essentially asking the people with the least amount of interest and also who tend to know the least about politics to join in a topic that they don't really want to talk about anyway. And so I think it's very difficult to build a solution where you're relying on, you know, ideological moderates or independents to try to be the glue because there's a reason that they find themselves in the center of the spectrum. They're, they're just on average much less interested in engaging with politics. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have a role to play in the solution. And I do a lot of social network analysis in my work. And, and I think what's important when thinking about moderates is to think about their structural role within our social networks and how they might be able to be a part of a solution, not because they're necessarily contributing to the conversation, but because they're helping bring people together. Moderates have more diverse social networks. They also tend to have a lower threshold for incivility, right? They, many people identify as independents because they don't like their perception of the, the tone of, of partisanship, right? So I think the idea is we should find ways not to get moderates to talk, but to get moderates to, to engage in this incentivizing the sort of rhetoric that they wanna hear. And there are a number of ways that this could be done. So one is that, you know, you can, social media sites can recognize on the back end who these individuals might be. And if those individuals like someone else's political content or otherwise engage with it, that could be a signal that it might be higher quality content, right? Either because it's more reasoned or it's, or it's less uncivil or whatever the case may be. And so I think weighting these people's opinions uh, into the algorithm could actually be a way to, to help pull in uh, the, the second definition you were talking about, the sort of incivility dimension, um, using the moderate's judgment about the kind of rhetoric they want to hear to, to fold in more of that sort of discussion into the dialogue. Thanks so much. Um, I want to I wanna go now to uh, Chloe Bacalar um, of Temple University, um, who I think is going to bring in some of the material from the, from the Q&A. Yeah, so um, people have been posting a bunch of really interesting questions, some of which are, are overlapping a little bit. So Jamie, if you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, can I give you two, two questions at a time? Yeah? yeah, sure, that's just fine. Okay, great. So, so one of the questions, uh, one of the themes of questions that seems to be coming up a lot is uh, how your theory uh, handles bad actors, mm -hmm. right? So the assumption, most of what you've been talking about here is how normal people uh, who are just using the site engage with it and, and what the impact of that is. But to what extent do you, can you account for um, people or bots or organizations that are 
uh, intentionally trying to manipulate not just political opinion, but specifically political affect, right? Mm -hmm. um, to what extent should we be worried about that? And can the same kind of tools that are used to hopefully uh, combat the, the affective polarization that happens on a, on a human level be, be applied to these actors as well or, or something else needed? So that's, that's one set of questions. Um, another set of questions, and, and first also thank you for uh, telling me how to pronounce parlor. I wasn't sure that it was <laughs> parlor, not parlay. So that's that's good. Um, one of the other sets of questions is how Facebook users uh, compare to other social media sites or to people who don't use social media. So you've, you've uh, told us quite a bit about what Facebook users look like. Uh, and now you've told us a bit about what they look like compared to other more extreme um, spaces, but in terms of the less extreme ones or the ones that we think of as being potentially friendlier uh, places like, like Instagram, even though uh, Facebook owns that, do we see some of the same problems popping up or uh, do they look different? Uh, do they have different problems or, or are they more encouraging? And I, I guess I'll, I'll stop there and then uh, get some more questions together for you. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, so on this first question, you know, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we got ourselves into a mess all by ourselves. We did not need, you know, foreign intervention. We did not need trolls and bots and other forms of computational propaganda to polarize us. The reason those bad actors were successful is because we'd already created the environment where we were receptive to that information and we'd already generated uh, so much of the, the kind of content that they were able to then exploit. And so it's, you know, I, I think the, the tools on how to address the problem I'm talking about, which is really interpersonal interaction among actual live Americans who communicate with each other on Facebook, it's going to be a different set of tools to tackle that problem than the tools that we need to deal with, you know, all different sorts of computational propaganda. Um, but the computational propaganda, the misinformation, the bots are going to be successful as long as we allow this really um, dangerous, highly polarized environment to, to persist on Facebook. And so I, and, and certainly the bad actors are making it worse, right? I mean, they're certainly inserting a lot more information into the ecosystem that people need to grapple with. Um, you know, I think one of the findings that comes out of the studies I did is that people really think that their political opponents use poor quality information and they think that they're not very knowledgeable about politics. And I asked, the, those data were collected in the spring of 2016. So really before, as a society, we recognize the full extent of the misinformation problem. And I think it's only going to be worse now. There's, there's just a lot more bad information out there. Um, and so you know, the, in terms of the, the tools, it's two different techniques, but we need to be fighting on both fronts at the same time. I mean, we need to be thinking about how can we identify inauthentic information on these sites to get it out. But even once you do that, I don't think it's going to solve the problem of the way that people are signaling and communicating with each other. And so that's where you have to, to think about uh, some of the solutions that I talked about earlier. Um, on the second question, in terms of how Facebook compares to other sites, you know, this question is, the answer to this question is constantly evolving. So at the time I collected data and wrote the book, uh, it was just before we started seeing one of the, the biggest trends, which is that younger people seem to be shifting away from Facebook and they're much more likely to be using other sites for their social interaction. Most of them still have Facebook accounts, um, but they use it to communicate like with their professors or with their teachers or which they're, you know, with their bosses. They don't think of it as their communication platform of choice. And 
you know, the, the trends are that I think Facebook users now, the, it, it's changing. It used to be that it was more young. Now it's gravitating towards more older people. Um, women are more likely to use Facebook, whereas on Twitter, I think the opposite is true. Um, and, you know, there are new sites, you know, all the time, sites that rise and fall. Um, and so the way I like to think about this is as opposed to thinking about uh, site compared to site or user base compared to user base, I think it's better to think about features on sites that lead to particular outcomes. And so in the last chapter of the book, I break apart what are the things about Facebook in particular that seem to be leading to these outcomes. And then you can look at those features and see which of these new sites have those same kinds of things. So for example, you know, Facebook, you still have a profile on Facebook. You still have an enduring permanent record of things that you have said and shared on the site. That's very different than a site, uh, you know, like Twitter, yes, you have, you know, a sort of profile you can dig in, but it's not the same sense that it's your, you know, your true self that you're sharing every aspect of your life. Uh, the kind of tie on Facebook is different, right? It's a bi-directional tie where you have to confirm a friendship, whereas in a lot of other sites, you follow people, but they're not necessarily going to follow you. And so if we're trying to make predictions about how much of this is a uniquely Facebook problem versus how much might be transferring to other sites. Um, it's best to look at these particular features and see what transfers. And I think one of the more interesting things to think about is the increasing dominance of um, images, pictures, and video. As a discipline, as political science doesn't it hasn't spent enough time thinking about that, but it's such a, a richer way to communicate your yourself, right? And so there's a lot to be studied there. Um, and so to the extent that I think younger people gravitate towards these more visually compelling ways of communicating, I think there are a lot of, of big questions we need to answer about how um, verbal or written communication is different from the communication of, of images or videos. Makes a lot of sense, um, and it's really, really interesting on, on these issues. Um, Chloe, did you have more from the from the Q and A queue that you wanted to bring in? Yeah, um, Jamie, if it's okay, I'll, I'll give you two more again. Sure. All right. So um, one of the questions, uh, and this one I'll just go directly. This is by uh, Abby Schwartz. asks How much of the polarization on social media and media in general is the result of many years of, uh, of labeling middle of the road political perspectives. So she cites, you know, CNN or even the New York Times as being super uh, liberal biased. Um, and how does this labeling contribute to more extreme positions uh, by the right and people moving right to avoid a liberal bias when we're actually talking about something uh, really pretty moderate. Um, the, the second question brings it back to the the subject of this whole speaker series this year freedom of speech um, so asking if you could maybe speak a little bit more about the way free speech is perceived on on these sites and you know there's a lot of misunderstanding about what american at least american uh free speech rights mean in terms of social media uh people seem to think that they have freedom from being um, from being censored by in lots of different ways, which which is not necessarily the case where they feel like their free, their free speech rights are being infringed upon uh, by the norms of the community or the, the community rules on Facebook. And um, maybe you could speak a little bit to that and how this fear uh, of being being attacked or being having your content demoted or removed might disencourage moderates, especially from from participating in discourse on on Facebook. Great, yeah, two two big questions to dive yeah. into there. Yeah, uh, just just some little stuff. <laughs> yeah, no no big deal. Um, so on this first question, I think there it's touching on two really interesting ideas that contribute to the overall big picture of polarization. And then I can talk a little bit about how I think they connect in social media. So one is this debate about 
the extent to which polarization is a, a balanced phenomena, and in that I mean, are both parties becoming um, extreme at the same rate? And the evidence suggests that no. The evidence suggests that the Republican Party has moved considerably more to the right than the Democratic Party has moved to the left. And so when we talk about the polarization problem, we need to be aware of this imbalance. Um, and I, you know, I think that does tie into the, the question about what's the middle, you know, this labeling of, of uh, you know, what's, uh, whether or not these sources that have historically been thought of as mainstream middle of the road sources are now being labeled as more liberal sources. Well, part of that is because Republicans on average have moved further to the right. So they, these sources now do look to the, the left half of the spectrum to them. Um, but a lot of that also has to do with media distrust, which has been a problem for a long time, but has been, you know, very much activated by our current president. I think the second thing the question was getting at is this uh, distinction between what we call symbolic versus operational ideology. Um, so in the US, when we think of symbolic ideology, that's what people want to label themselves. There's a clear preference that people prefer to label themselves conservative or moderate compared to liberal. And so if, if you ask people, it looks like our country leans more to the right. However, if you ask about their operational ideology, what, what their preferences are in terms of the policies that differentiate the left and right, they appear liberal. They prefer policies that appear more liberal. Now, this distinction predates the rise of social media. I think what social media has done has made you know, made the word liberal, which, you know, was a dirty word before social media has has made it even more part of the rhetoric. And this is where elite communication, the way that our elected officials talk about politics has definitely contributed in that um, people are parroting what they hear. And so if we, um, you know, push these labels and make these labels have bad connotations in people's minds, that is going to have an effect on on how we talk to each other. Um, this second question about free speech is, is a hard one. And, you know, I am not uh, a constitutional law scholar here. I'm not someone who can really parse out all of uh, the issues related to free speech on social media. Um, but I'll talk about a few of, of the things that I think matter. So one is there is a lot of ambiguity about uh, what companies um, can and should be doing in our current legal framework. And so this relates to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1995. Everybody is unhappy with this on both sides of the aisle, um, but, but Republicans and Democrats want very different changes to be made to it. Um, Republicans feel that uh, social media companies are using Section 230 as a, as a shield to be able to moderate too much and remove too much content from social media, whereas um, Democrats tend to think that social media companies are not going far enough and are, are using Section 230 as a shield to not be even more stringent in the kinds of moderation they're doing on mis and disinformation. So there is a lot of ambiguity about um, what companies should be doing under this current legal framework. When you layer that on top of Americans total misunderstanding of what the First Amendment even is for the most part. I mean, I don't, I don't have a statistic offhand to, to back this up, but I bet if you ask people, most people are not going to recognize that the First Amendment has to do with the government regulating your speech, not with a private company regulating your speech. Now, the thorny issue here is that if Facebook has become so dominant that it is like the public square, what do we expect of a private company to regulate what has become a public forum? And that's a really big question. That's a huge question. But I don't think it's one we should leave to you know, Facebook to figure out itself. They need more guidance to figure out what we want uh, of, you know, are expecting of them within this role, because the ability to communicate so widely and broadly and have your information disseminated so quickly really is unprecedented, even if um, social media and its broad definition is, is not all that, that new in terms of social forms of media uh, dispersion. Uh, and so I think, you know, 
the other thing I like to push back on people is, you know, when they're feeling like they're, they're not able to say something on social media, whatever it was that you were about to put on social media, would you be comfortable going into the most public place wherever you live and standing on a soapbox and shouting that? And if you really are, if you are willing to come face to face with people and have them go back and forth with you about whatever your beliefs are, then I think you should be able to say that on social media. But we forget just how much face to face communication can moderate what we're willing to say because we become so much more aware of our listeners perspective based on how their, their, you know, their facial expression, their verbal communication. Uh, and so, you know, this whole debate, it's, it's no surprise that people with more moderate viewpoints don't want to jump in given all of this. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure that that is the most important part of the overall free speech uh, questions at play here, given that there's a lot more dangerous speech than, you know, people saying that they don't like what a, a moderate has to say about politics. I want to actually, on this, uh, pivot to another side of the, the question of the relationship between social media practices and, say, legal norms. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the free speech question um, in, in that sort of constitutional First Amendment form um, is, is kind of a question about how spaces like, like Facebook feel, look and feel as public fora from the perspective of, of the users who um, you know, are, are sort of sort of speaking in them. Um, but then, of course, there's also the question of how these things look from the from the from the top down perspective, the the um, the that external regulatory perspective of, of the government and the um, sort of sort of initiatives taken by um, Facebook corporate leadership itself. Um, you know, just just today, there was this sort of sort of huge, you know, set of headlines about about new antitrust actions being taken against Facebook. Um, you know, uh, states and um, federal government uh, sort of arguing that that there are respects in which Facebook operates as a as an illegal monopoly. Um, and you know, a, a couple times in your presentation, you you gestured to to having to take seriously um, the limits of what we can expect of um, corporations like Facebook. Um, in view of the fact that they are for-profit um, enterprises that you know monetize the the behavior of their users by tracking it and turning it into you know um, ad dollars, um, do you think that uh, there's something there's something significant about these 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 new developments in antitrust law or the potential developments in antitrust law? Um, you know, occasionally at, at an even sort of more extreme end of the political spectrum, so to speak, you'll hear people calling for, you know, sort of things that sound almost almost utopian, like nationalize Facebook. Um, you know, even if we don't think that that's likely to happen anytime soon, like how should we think about about the implications of the fact that there are limits to what we can expect um, uh, a for profit um, and sort of monopolistic company like Facebook to actually actually do? Yeah, you know, it's. It's interesting to think back and and maybe people who are older than I am would have a different perspective on this, but trying to think back before the rise of social media in terms of what expectations people had about how they should be able to communicate with others and, and what they were sort of entitled to expect and being able to connect with others. And I think this is one of you know, the most pivotal lasting legacies of Facebook, whether or not it's Facebook as we know it three years from now, 10 years from now, is that it has changed the way we think about how we're entitled to communicate, right? I mean, we really do think that we now should be able to instantaneously broadcast our views and have other people hear them, right? We don't want to have our, our views censored or limited, or, or we don't like to think about the way that, that the company is using an algorithm so that not everyone's able to hear what we're saying. Um, and I think tied into that is, is a paradox, I guess I sort of hinted at earlier in that 
part of what makes these sites so appealing is that everyone is on them. And so the value in using Facebook and why it's so hard for consumers to overcome this collective action problem to demand more rights with respect to their data is that you want to be on the site where everyone is. And so, you know, you quitting the site to try to send a message to these companies is, is not very effective. And so that runs against this, notion that these companies should be broken up on antitrust and that people want to be where everyone else is right and that's going to lead to very large powerful companies um and and i don't know if that's going to change i i think that it'll a lot will depend on like generation z do they still do they have this notion that they want to be on the sites where everyone else is or are they supportive of having a bunch of different social media sites where you do different types of communication to different audiences and if that becomes the preference then all of a sudden you know Facebook doesn't benefit from being so large and being so dominant. And you can see it being more of a concern if they are keeping out other competitors from the market, if, if that's what consumers really want. Um, so I don't know that that totally got to your question, but I do think there's some, we, there's a lot of things we don't know about what consumers actually want uh, when it comes to this space. Oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to pull in a question from the, uh, from the queue here from um, a student named Anna Callahan, um, who's asking about a, a related aspect of this, less about what consumers want and more about um, how things look from, from the state perspective. Um, Anna asks, how do you think the movement to revise or repeal Section 230, you know, going back to what you were saying before, will factor into how media, social media platforms um, evolve over time? Um, and, and in particular, do you think that um, in, you know, with regard to these Section 230 conversations, do you think that, that the government should be playing a role in shaping um, how social media companies regulate misinformation and, and disinformation in particular, right? So even aside from the sort of antitrust questions, um, do you think there's, there's, you know, what do you think the way forward is on these sort of, sort of specific, specific issues in relation to, you know, credible information on these platforms? Yeah, so, so I definitely think that, you know, there, I think social media companies behavior to date has largely been about avoiding changes to the, the status quo regulatory environment, right? I mean, essentially, social media companies have no interest in being the arbiters of truth. The way Section 230 is written and has been interpreted to date allowed them to be in this space where they could they could avoid it. They could sort of take, you know, do the minimal amount of moderation and and not be held responsible for doing more or doing less. And so if those floodgates have opened, if it's now, you know, if the train has left the gate, that Section 230 is going to be changed in some way, shape, or form, the the company strategies, I think, shift from avoiding regulatory change to achieving the optimal change that is inevitably going to come. And, and that's where you could see differences between platforms based on the culture that develop uh, within these companies in terms of how they really see their site. I mean, Parler would obviously be advocating for very different Section 230 changes than, you know, Facebook would, than Twitter would, um, you know, than a site like Pinterest might or something, right? So um so i do think we'll see a change but i think it's too early to know what exactly that change is going to be um and uh could you i'm sorry the second part of the question uh could you just give me a quick refresher oh, oh, just just uh she was curious to hear you know with, with regard to the specific question of the regulation of of misinformation and disinformation yeah yeah this is it's so thorny i mean Yes, this is mis and disinformation are threats to our democracy, right? I mean, we there is a role in trying to uh, limit the circulation of that information, um, but this is the the way that mis and disinformation spread in the pre-internet, pre-social media days was just so fundamentally different, and we have not caught up in terms of our societal expectations, in terms of our legal framework, in terms of our regulatory framework, 
Um, I think there is a role for government, but it, it might require some really big shifts in terms of, you know, what, how do we interpret the First Amendment, right? Like, these are really core questions that I think you've been getting at in this series. And so, you know, I think the answer is yes, there is a role for government, but I don't think we have achieved anything close to a consensus about what we want that role to be. Thanks. Um, I want to go back to, to Chloe here, who had a follow-up also. Yeah, uh, thank you so much again, Jamie. I'm, I'm so uh, happy that you're here specifically right now because all of this uh, discourse about Section 230 and, and the possible breaking up of Facebook is so salient and it's great hearing your, your views on it. Uh, in response to, to your response to, um, to one of Matt's questions, you, you talked about how we'll see what younger users choose to do. So since, since you published the book, we know already they've chosen to do certain things that you've, you've outlined here. They gravitate towards more visual medium. Uh, they don't spend as much time on Facebook, although they do spend a fair amount of time on uh, sites or platforms that Facebook owns. Um, but that got me thinking, and very often when we're having these debates, I know that the focus of your research is, is mostly on the US, uh, but Facebook, of course, is a, a global company. Um, and so while young people in the US may mostly have the choice to belong or not to belong, uh, in, in large parts of the world, that choice isn't quite so, so clear. I was talking to a colleague who did uh, his doctoral work research on social media and, and the internet in Cambodia. And he said that the people that he worked with there, they had no idea that Facebook wasn't just the internet. Like instead of just typing into your search bar on your, on your computer, a question and getting getting Google's answer, uh, everything was mediated through Facebook and it wasn't really an option to do it otherwise. And then even within the United States, right, we have more, uh, more choice, but that choice breaks down a bit uh, depending on where where you fall in the socioeconomic spectrum. So people who fall on the, the lower end are much more reliant on Facebook, not just for their social networking, but for uh, professional networking, for, for professional resources and, and all sorts of those things. So it's it's much less of a choice. And basically, yeah, I'm saying all of this to, to tee you up to, I think, one of the points you were trying to make earlier uh, about is Facebook, should Facebook be considered a public utility or some kind of, um, some, some kind of institution that's quasi-governmental and maybe in a, a similar way to the way the traditional news media is treated as the, the fourth estate with responsibilities that come along with its, its freedoms. And just sort of see if you, if you can speak to maybe the inequality and lack of, lack of ability to leave and, and how that might relate to Facebook's status as maybe not purely a, a private for-profit company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a huge point. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a, dis a distinction between thinking about the, the public utility model versus thinking about, uh, you know, Facebook is a media company and, and how would regulation look different if we try to think about Facebook as a media company as opposed to a technology company. Um, I think the, the argument about Facebook as a utility company, um, yeah, it's a really complex one, right? It's essentially, um, it, I think the, the good that is being provided by Facebook is so fundamentally different from the good that's been provided by other public utilities, even even you know like telephone companies as a public utility, like it's the the form of communication that's facilitated on Facebook is just different in a lot of ways. And so, I I would be open to talking about that. I am not the person to to weigh in. That's you know really much more of a legal regulatory question. Um, but this other distinction in terms of thinking about Facebook as a media company and what would we expect Facebook to do if it really were a media company, I, I will weigh in on that one. And, you know, I think what's really interesting there is if you talk to people in the media, they really do have this kind of love-hate relationship with Facebook in that there many media companies are often reliant on it 
for getting information out, right, and disseminating their articles and driving up user engagement and the metrics in terms of, of what stories people are interested in and, and the ability, you know, um, driving traffic to their sites. But they also hate it because changes that Facebook makes to its platform or to its algorithm can have really important consequences. I mean, in some cases, destroying certain media companies' entire business model. And so, you know, I'm not sure that Facebook, uh, I, I don't know that the analogy of treating Facebook as a media company in the same way that we treat, you know, NBC, ABC, CBS. I don't think that's quite right either. That's not quite the right fit. But building in some of the expectations we have from companies that do control access to information, I think that's at least a starting place to think about how you might want, what, what we might expect of Facebook. Um, but you have, from the get-go, you'd have to recognize all the ways in which Facebook is different than like a broadcast company. Um, one one thing that I think is often maybe maybe lost a little bit in the in the sort of American specific uh, conversation about these kinds of social media dynamics, which has been such a prominent conversation, um, uh, you know, over the last four years, especially, um, is you know the, the the fundamentally also international character of Facebook as a as a sort of platform. Um, this this question is a little bit speculative because it goes a little bit beyond the scope of, of what you've been talking about mostly. But I'm interested whether um, you think that uh, the the international character of platforms like Facebook, or even the fundamentally sort of transnational way in which it operates, um, either obviously it complicates questions like government regulation, but does it also create different kinds of possibilities for how these psychological dynamics can can change or or, or be redirected? Have, have you have have there have there been ways that these dynamics have played out um, you know outside the United States in how you see Facebook being used in other countries that you think um, can can model things that can be pushed for in the American context as well? Um, it's a super open-ended question, but something that I've been thinking about a lot as I've watched this kind of conversation unfold over the last few years. Yeah, um, so I, I think it's a really interesting thing to think about how the, the structure of the site, which is largely similar across countries, even though there are important differences in different countries in terms of what Facebook looks like or what features users are able to use, um, you know, how, the, how the, that structure, how those affordances interact both with a country's culture, but also with a country's political structure. Uh, I think you've seen, you know, a handful of instances, uh, several in Southeast Asia, where uh, Facebook interacted with culture and politics in an exceptionally negative way that makes the problem in the United States just pale in comparison. And so I think there are certainly models we don't want to follow. Um, you know, at the same time, this, this sort of notion of the unique configuration of, of American institutions and structures, I mean, we're a country that is well suited towards polarization, right? It's very easy in a two party system uh, to end up with this us versus them mentality. Um, and so, I, you know, I think a lot has, a lot of what we see in the U.S. has to do with the way that our political structure gets reflected. Um, but I could certainly imagine a situation in a country that, that either has a multi-party system or has a two-party system um, that is not as contentious as ours is at the moment, that you might be able to, to look abroad and think, what is it about their political culture that seems to be keeping the, their political institutions in check in the way that people are communicating online. Makes a lot of sense, thanks. Um, all right, well, we have time for probably one last um, long question. Uh, and I'm gonna go back to, to Chloe for that, who wants to pull from the queue once again. Yeah, so uh, now that we've reached the last couple of minutes, I wanna go back to a question that Trisha Conley posed towards the beginning. Uh, which feels like a nice natural place to end for for people who haven't had the opportunity yet to read uh, to read frenemies uh, you you offer a bunch of ideas of, of where where people should be looking what kinds of system features are more or less problematic and, and provides sort of a, a, a 
gentle-ish suggestion of, of how to get out of this mess that we're in. Um, so Trisha is asking if, if you have any antidotes for this problem where people don't mean to be, some people do, but a lot of people aren't even talking politics on Facebook and yet somehow we're becoming more and more disagreeable to each other. Uh, since, since not everyone's had the chance to read, would you mind uh, sharing, sharing the solution? Leave us on an optimistic note, please. Sure. Sure. So I'll, th I'll throw two things out there. I mean, I, I think it is very easy to get discouraged when thinking or talking about this problem because it, it is so complicated and it, it would require so much collective action on solutions that we all have a lot of uncertainty about. Um, but I don't think we should lose sight of the things we can do at the individual level that could make things better. Um, so, you know, the, the first thing that I think is really helpful is to um, think about the ways that, the, that our behaviors on social media uh, can amplify the problems or amplify solutions. So when you click on something, when you engage with something, when you click the like button and, and, and react to something, when you write a comment on something, your choices matter. Your choices affect the way that Facebook's algorithm works. And so part of the reason that we see such you know, emotionally evocative content be more likely to circulate is because that's what people tend to be responding to the most. Uh, you know, com posts that get more comments are more likely to be circulated and tend to rise higher in, in people's algorithms. And so I think just making a check on yourself when you're engaging with content that someone else has posted, are you choosing, you're voting essentially, are you choosing to endorse you know, behavior that you want to see more of on the site and that, that you think sh that should be more widespread or are you creating part of the problem? And so being mindful of that is my first suggestion. Um, my second suggestion is that, you know, as much as I talk about the ways in which our social identities have aligned with our political identities, which has facilitated the process that I talk about on social media, we all have all sorts of idiosyncratic ways in which we don't fit the stereotype of our political views. And if you recognize those, amplify those, right? So if you are a, you know, liberal who loves to hunt, it could be a good idea for you to post a picture when you do something that people associate with the other side and actively showing the people in your network that that we are multifaceted people and that the stereotypes might you know on average be connected to to patterns that we're able to measure yes you know conservatives are more likely to own a gun right but that doesn't mean there aren't liberals who do and, and use it for purposes like hunting so in ways in which you can um, help counter the stereotypes that people might have. I think that's another really effective way um, to try to break this link we seem to have between um, the way that people live their lives and what they choose to post on Facebook and, and what their political views might be. Well, thank you so much for, um, for those final comments on, on how we can move forward and for this entire presentation and conversation. Um, I know that we're, we're really grateful to have you as part of this event series and it's a great way to end the, the semester. Um, thanks also, thanks again to, to, to Chloe Bacalar for all your assistance with, um, with the event. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see um, some of you in the, in the uh, student round table with SNF Paidea and, and Table Talk in a few minutes here. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone that although this is the conclusion of our fall program, we're only halfway through our entire um, year long event series. Um, and you can see more of what we have coming up in the spring um, on the Andrea Mitchell Center's website. Um, and uh, we thank you for coming tonight and look forward to seeing you all in the spring. Take care. Thank you.